And next, I'd like to invite up Faith Hodgkins. Good afternoon. I'm Faith Hodgins. I'm a postdoctoral research assistant at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. And I work with Professor Sharon Abrahams. Sharon is a clinical neuropsychologist and the chair of neuropsychology at the university. And she was very involved. She actually led the development of the Edinburgh Cognitive and Behavioral ALS screen. And I'm really glad to be here today to tell you about some work that we've been doing over the last year, funded by the MNDA. We've been going around the UK training health professionals, allied professionals in particular, to use and administer this cognitive and behavioural screening tool. So I'd first like to highlight why it was felt that this training was needed, and I'm going to refer to the tool as the ECAS from this point forward. So, we know now that ALS is not just a disease of the motor neurons. In about 50% of patients, um, they will just experience motor symptoms. But for 15% of patients, um, there will also be a diagnosis of frontotemporal dementia. Then there's this approximately 35% of patients who will experience some um, degree of cognitive and or behavioral change, which will have some overlap overlapping symptoms with frontotemporal dementia. What this means um, in terms of uh, the impact on life is um, deficits and problems with planning and decision making, problems with generating words and ideas, and some issues with social cognition. And this has a direct impact on caregiver burden, adherence to life prolonging interventions, and care planning. So as Rachel Boothman highlighted this morning, we have these nice guidelines now in the UK, and the need to consider cognition and behavior when the treating and supporting patients with ALS is really interwoven throughout that document. It's actually mentioned more than 40 times. I've just picked out three mentions uh, to give an example. So, and um, the first, at diagnosis, if there's concern about cognition and behavior, that needs to be explored with the person and their family members, and a formal assessment needs to be considered as well. The multidisciplinary team needs to assess, manage, and review cognition and behavior and psychological support needs. And the multidisciplinary team should be assessing um, the person's needs, taking into account any cognitive and behavioural changes they may be experiencing. So I'm now going to highlight why we feel the ECAS is an appropriate tool to use. So the ECAS has been designed specifically for ALS. It's designed to be used when people have some level of physical disability. So each of the questions in the cognitive screen can be completed either by speaking or writing, and assistive technology can be used as well, providing predictive text is switched off. It's suitable to be used by neuropsychologists and robust enough that it should satisfy their requirements, but other health professionals can use it too and should find it easy to use. It assesses multiple domains affected, and so for the cognitive screen, it assesses executive functions, language functions, fluency, memory, and visuospatial functions. And the visuospatial functions are added in just to try and pick up if there may be an Alzheimer's deficit rather than FTD. It's also very quick to use. It takes about 20 minutes when the assessor is experienced, and so long as the patient doesn't have, um, is, uh, isn't too physically disabled. When compared to a full neuropsychological battery of assessments, which would take between two and three hours, this quick 20-minute tool has a sensitivity and specificity of 85%. And so that's, that's quite good. So I'm, I'm going to describe how we are implementing this currently in Scotland, one part of the UK. Um, and how we're recommending it be implemented and um, throughout the rest of the country. So I, I should mention that um, in Scotland we have a devolved government, so some resources and health services are allocated differently. And in Scotland we have um, quite a good provision of, of clinical neuropsychology. So if you have a patient that you want to screen, 
There are two routes by which you can do this. The first is to direct, directly refer them to a clinical psychologist for um, an assessment, or an MND healthcare specialist, like a clinical nurse specialist, can administer the ECAS and then seek out some supervision from a neuropsychologist in terms of interpreting those results and thinking of any interventions or support for the family. The key thing in Scotland is that we've really tried to reinforce that need for a link with a neuropsychology service. So even if it's a clinical nurse specialist administering the ECAS, they have that supervision, they have that expertise on board. In the rest of the UK, um, coverage for clinical neuropsychology is patchy. Um, and so as we've gone around training people to use the ECAS, we have emphasised that there is a certain amount of information that you can get from it that will be very useful as an MDT. But to get maximum impact from the tool, a link with neuropsychology would be really beneficial. So this is what we did. Um, working very closely with Rachel Boothman and Steve Bell from the MNDA, we developed um, a training program that we felt was appropriate. This was advertised by the MNDA to health professionals working with patients with ALS. We then ran the training in nine different locations in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. And a few months before that, we trialled it in Edinburgh, training all the clinical nurse specialists in Scotland. Okay, this is who came. So we had 245 people in a roughly six month period. And we trained them in, in nine different sessions, so around 25 to 30 people at a time. And the majority of those who attended were either occupational therapists, nurses, or speech and language therapists. And we had some care coordinators, and a few psychologists, a handful of palliative care consultants, and uh, neurologists as well as some others. Before the trainees came to um, the training day, which we called a masterclass, we asked them to go onto the ECAS website and watch a training video this video shows an ECAS being administered by a clinical nurse specialist. And we asked them to read the guidelines which are also available on the website and to look at the ECAS form and if possible, have a go with a friend before coming to the masterclass. These resources are all available on our website and the address will come up at the end of the presentation as well. The masterclass was a full day. In the morning, when they arrived, we asked the trainees to complete a quick multiple choice knowledge assessment. We then went in to start the training. Sharon Abrahams did a presentation on the latest um, findings and knowledge about cognitive and behavioral change in ALS. And then we did a guided role play. So two trainees kindly volunteered, came to the front, one um, role played being a health professional, one role played being a patient, and they went through the cognitive screening part of the ECAS. Everyone else in attendance scored an ECAS form alongside that, and Asharan and I narrated the, um, the guidance around scoring as we went through. After lunch, Sharon Abrahams discussed some of her own case studies, and we opened up the discussion and asked other health professionals to contribute their experiences and also to discuss how they might go about implementing the ECAS in their local context using whatever resources they had. Before the trainees left, we asked them to complete an ECAS competency assessment. So we showed a video on the screen, and the video was Sharon and I role-playing an ECAS. Um, and we asked everyone to score an ECAS form along with that video. We then collected in their forms and sent each person individual feedback on their scoring, just pointing out any small errors they might have still been making at the end of the training day. And then before they left, we asked them to complete um, the multiple choice quiz again and to fill in an evaluation form, just letting us know what they felt they would take away from the day. So these are, are the results from the knowledge assessment, the multiple choice quiz. Um, it was scored out of 19, when at the start of the day, on average, people scored 15, which is already quite high. It wasn't as a, an easy quiz, um, but we think we were 
uh, getting the right people through the door, basically people who had some level of knowledge um, about the issues and who were maybe ready to start implementing the ECAS in their practice. At the end of the day, people were scoring 18 on average out of 19, so there was an increase in their knowledge. We asked them about their confidence in using the ECAS by the end of the training day, and the majority of respondents were quite confident to go away and use the ECAS. We also asked them an open-ended question, what will you take back to practice from the training? I just coded their answers um, qualitatively into these five themes, um, which came out of what people were reporting. Uh, some people reported that they felt they could commit now to implementing the ECAS with patients and made quite a strong statement about doing that. Others made a slightly less strong statement saying they would go away and discuss the usage of the ECAS with the rest of their team. For others, um, they they also felt they needed to go away and explore opening up a pathway to neuropsychology in their local context. Most people reported that they gained new knowledge regarding the changes in ALS and the use of the ECAS. And a small number of people said that they would go away and use this knowledge to inform and support patients and families. Here's an example of, of what people said. So when our specialist reported, she'd been reluctant to use the ECAS before, as she was not confident. I now feel able to use it and incorporate this in our MDT assessments. A speech and language therapist reported a greater awareness of the potential cognitive changes in MND and how these may impact upon management. I'd like to liaise with other members of the MDT to establish how ECAS can be incorporated into practice. And a care coordinator reporting they were more confident to use this tool. As a network, they will work out the best way to implement this tool. And they point out a really important point, um, this care coordinator is based in, in England, it said the shame that we have a lack of neuropsychologists, we may need more help in how to best support patients identified with impairment. That's an important point that I'll come back to in a moment. So we have evaluated the, the immediate impact of the training, as in what the impact was on the actual day. We want to look at what the impact of using the ECAS is in practice. So we're going to conduct um, several case studies across the UK in different locations. And this will look at uh, places where the ECAS is already being implemented or has been implemented since this training took place. And we'll look at the impact on patients, on carers, on the neurologist or palliative care consultant, on the nurse specialist or whoever else is implementing the ECAS, if it's occupational therapist or speech and language therapist, and also look at the impact on the practice of a neuropsychologist, and also the impact that having a neuropsychologist on board with that pathway has on the overall impact of the ECAS on the care delivered to the patients and the support given to carers. So our conclusions from the training was that we managed to train 245 healthcare professionals and we found that this increased their knowledge and confidence to use the ECAS and the desire to share the knowledge with their wider team and implement the ECAS. I'd point out again the website address um, where you can access all the training, um, most of the training materials, the training video, um, a video of a lecture delivered by Sharon, um, the ECAS form itself, the guidelines, frequently asked questions, and um, there's a lot on there, so I would encourage you to check it out. And lastly, I'd just like to acknowledge um, the great support and input that we had from Steve Bell and Rachel Boothman from the MNDA. Um, and also um, Sharon Abrahams, who's leading this uh, project from the University of Edinburgh. Um, and I didn't mention, but I, I should mention that we did get um, accreditation from the European Network to Cure ALS um, for the training program and um, for this uh, ECAS masterclass as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, and there are time for questions. There. Hello, Sarah Cadell, Wales. I was fortunate enough to attend one of your classes, so thank you for that. 
But my question is, when do you feel it's appropriate to do the test and can it be repeated? Okay, that's a really great question. Thank you very much. Um, in Scotland, uh, there's not a set policy, but there's a general approach that the ECAS is conducted um, around the time of diagnosis, so usually within a few weeks of the diagnosis um, being given to the patient. And it's approached in a, in a, a kind of a way where the, it's said to the patient, this is a routine assessment, and it is a routine assessment in Scotland, and this is just part of all the other assessments you will do at this point in your care. Um, and uh, that can be used then as a baseline to compare later. If you do feel there's some changes happening and you want to do an ECAS again, you can do that several months down the line and compare and, and you have an objective measure. Um, you can ECAS a patient again. Um, just uh, published now are two new versions in English of the ECAS. Um, and you, you can use those versions if you're testing within six months. If you're testing after six months, you can use the same version again. Hello, thank you for such interesting presentation. My name is Sheila and I am a neurologist from Indonesia. I also represent the Indonesia ALS um, Association. Uh, we routinely screen our ALS patients in Indonesia using Mini Mental State Examination or MMSE if you know. Uh, and so um, this e-casting is pretty much new to us here. Um, maybe you can share with us um, why uh, we are being promoted to use ECAS, like what's the different with MMS, uh, the mini mental state, um, because you said it's very specific for the ALS population, so because if it is uh, pretty much that good, maybe we, uh, I can take it home and share with my uh, fellow colleagues. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for that question. So the ECAS is evidence-based and it assesses the domains, the cognitive domains that have been found to be affected in ALS. So some of these other cognitive assessments that you can use on other aging populations assess some of those domains, but not all of them. And if they do, they don't take account of physical disability in the way the ECAS does. So with the ECAS, as I mentioned, you can complete each section written, spoken, or using assistive technology. Um, and in, for example, the verbal fluency test, which um, assesses um, the production of language, um, we have a, a particular control for physical disability in that test. And there's a further explanation of that in the training video, which you can watch on the website. And that is unique to the ECAS as well. Hi, uh, my name's Kylie Crystal. I'm an OT from Macquarie University in Sydney. I was just wondering if you could um, expand a little bit further on how you might support your clients if there's um, distress caused um, by having to inform them that they're, they're, they're dementing as part of their illness. Okay, that that's part is not specifically part of my role, so I can't speak from personal experience of doing that. Um, I'll just uh, declare that first of all. Um, what I know from talking to some of the clinical nurse specialists in Scotland is that you would be um, careful about saying that to a patient. Um, there are implications, for example, um, if it's passed on to the family, people may make assumptions about their decision-making abilities, etc. Um, doing an ECAS as a member of the MDT, you're not that doesn't qualify you to make a diagnosis of dementia or impairment, and um, that has to be done through um, a clinical neuropsychologist, that has to be done through a full assessment. Um, so we're giving this tool to MD members of the MDT so that they can gain some insight, and, um, but it's not a tool to be used on its own to diagnose dementia. Thank you very much.